My name is Andrew Gary, Publications Outreach Editor at the Society of Exploration Geophysicists. I am joined by Kurt Marfert, Professor of Geophysics at the University of Oklahoma's ConocoPhillips School of Geology and Geophysics and Editor-in-Chief of the scholarly journal Interpretation. The journal aims to accelerate innovation and interpretation for resource exploration, exploitation, and environmental stewardship. Interpretation is jointly published by the American Association of Petroleum Geologists and the SEG. Kurt is going to highlight some of the articles from the May 2016 issue. Welcome, Kurt. Well, thanks for the invitation to this podcast, Andrew. Yes, I've been the editor of Interpretation since uh, October 2015, uh, taking over from Yonge Sun, who was our first editor. Well, the May issue contains 34 papers, including 11 technical papers and one paper in the Tools, Techniques, and Tutorials section. Let's start with a letter from the editor that was co-authored with Isaac Farley, SEG's Digital Publications Manager. Why did you feel it necessary to dedicate the letter from the editor to this subject, including recording several tutorial videos to support authors? I'm glad you gave me the opportunity to talk about this. The focus of the May and August from the editor section of interpretation are prompted by two forces. The first force is generational. Most of our student, young professional, and mid-career geoscientists They uh, access information digitally, preferring online versions of newspapers, uh, online versions of professional journals, such as interpretation. Even older uh, geoscientists like myself, I prefer to read a newspaper in print in the morning, and I like to page through a journal interpretation and geophysics as it comes out in hard copy. But when I want to go back, search for something, use things in a lecture or a class, I too will access the digital journal. So the second force is technological, and since its inception three years ago, interpretation has provided a means of including animated figures for the online version of the journal. So we have the younger people like to do things online, and now we have this new capability online of providing animations. Unfortunately, uh, the word really hasn't gotten out to our authors. We've had only one or two animations in the publications in the first three years. So in the May issue, I worked with Isaac Farley at the SCG to generate a suite of example animations and instructions on how to generate them. These animations, they can be as simple as a seismic section, a with and without interpretation, a well log, with and without interpretation, traditional seismic images before and after applying a given filter, or they can be quite fancy, a fly-through or rotation of a geobody, like a three-dimensional salt dome or of a complex reservoir. Now, such animations... We use them all the time when we give presentations at the SEG International Meeting. So we make use of animations routinely. And what Isaac has done, he's shown how to use PowerPoint to take three or four slides and generate a movie loop out of them. And then we upload that video as our animation file in the online version of Interpretation. One thing that I like that you say in in the letters to the editor is that it helps validate the author's observations. So it can help prove the point a lot easier with an animation than just an image or even a figure. That's correct. When you're side by side, it's very difficult for a human being to, to be not prejudiced by the interpretation on top of it. So by animating through, your eye is, your, it's really not your eye, it's your brain is able to image the differences between the uninterpreted section and the interpreted section, or the data as it came into a processing shop, or the data after it's gone through a new filter to improve it. So you see changes in sharpening or improvements in bandwidth. And something to keep in mind for authors, the research has shown that for scholarly articles that have some video or audio component, they have substantially more readers and more viewers. So it's another way to get your information and your research uh, into as many hands as possible. 
I agree with that. When I work, I, of course, being a professor, I work with students, and they're forever grabbing little video clips from the web to show a complex mathematical concept or a wave propagation uh, phenomena. So moving ahead, in the special section, Unconventional Exploration and Production, Achievements and Remaining Challenges, there is an article by Christian Slanger, Dario Grana, and Aaron Campbell Stone discussing how to use expectation maximization, EM, to distinguish between reservoir and non-reservoir quality shale facies. What excites you about this contribution regarding unconventional resources? Well, expectation maximization, or EM for short, is one of several emerging technologies that fall into the general area of what many people now call data analytics. While many of our listeners may not be familiar with this word, they're familiar with the process. So anyone who's bought a book on Amazon.com or uh, on Google has been confronted with uh, pop-up menus. And the pop-up menus say, other people who have bought this book have also bought these other books. And it's not limited to books. It can be, it can be uh, electronics, music. Last week I bought some automotive parts. It showed me all the parts that connect to that automotive part. So they're doing statistics. So companies like Google and Amazon have tens if not hundreds of millions of purchases from which they can generate probability density functions. So what Schlanzer and Grana and Campbell Stone have done, they are taking well logs, and in a resource play, we we'll won't have one well or two wells. We might have hundreds of wells. We can start to generate statistics. The statistics are multidimensional. Why are they multidimensional? Because we have different kinds of logs. We'll have logs that are sensitive to density, to p-velocity, to self-potential, to gamma-ray behavior, etc. In unconventional reservoirs, one of the things of greater interest is the rock brittle or not. Now, can we use those few logs that measure brittleness directly or indirectly, find relationships with the simpler logs, triple combo logs, for example, which are used in almost all wells, and then, given those triple combo logs, find out areas that, from a probabilistic point of view, are going to be more brittle or more ductile. Now, this fits neatly, this probabilistic Gaussian statistics technique doesn't tell you this is brittle and this is not ductile it gives you a probability that it reaches a certain level. And this kind of statistical approach actually fits into one that is used by almost all the major oil companies for 20 years uh, called risk analysis. So in a major oil company, if you're going to drill a prospect, you need to put numbers on what's the most likely thickness of the reservoir, and then, well, what could be the smallest thickness, what could be the biggest thickness, and you put numbers on those, and they go into a uh, Monte Carlo simulation. So having numbers for things like brittleness and permeability, percentage of fractures, that fits nicely into the quantitative risk analysis. As a non-geophysicist, I found this article particularly interesting because I really liked how they gave the geological history of the Marcellus shale. And I don't know if these particular terms I could grasp a little more, but I was following along pretty clearly on this article and understood what they were trying to do and what they did achieve. And I, I enjoyed reading this one. Well, I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because one of our objectives in interpretation is to have special issues uh, that are basin-specific. And in particular, right now, we have a call for papers on the Eastern Appalachian shale plays, the Marcellus uh, being the biggest of them. There's also the Utica and maybe some others. The readership wants to know not one view on the Marcellus. They would like to see 
maybe eight or ten different views? And is there consensus by the industry as to whether a given workflow is useful in their basin, not somebody else's basin? So moving on, uh, Jingming Wu and Dave Hale continue to build off their past research in their new article titled Automatically Interpreting All Faults, Unconformities, and Horizons from 3D Seismic Images. What does this latest advancement by Wu and Hale propose? Well, computer-aided seismic interpretation has been a major goal of uh, seismic interpreters since the early 1980s when companies like Landmark, Cytex, and the forerunner of uh, GeoFrame came up with their first interpretation workstations. Today, given good quality seismic data, almost all commercial software uh, provides a means to auto-pick seismic reflectors. They also provide seismic attributes that highlight seismic discontinuities, such as faults. Now, Wu and Hale do this quite nicely in terms of auto-picking not just the reflectors, but also the faults. But they address a much more difficult problem. Can a computer estimate the throw about a fault uh, with minimum human intervention? Where do you see the next advancement coming in this research? Well, quantifying such throw is uh, it's critical to planning lateral wells. You want to stay in your zone of interest. However, it can also help and using things like finite element modeling of uh, stresses and strains, it can also help define what the strain was in the geologic pattern. So how did this throw evolve through time and then by knowing the shape of the fault and its deformation history, can we estimate which areas are going to be more likely to have natural fractures in them and therefore have higher permeability? Their results that they show are excellent. They're using a good quality data set. And whether the reader thinks it'll work on their data today, this is definitely the direction the industry is going and needs to go in. So they're, they're leaders in this area. Go read the article. Lastly, let's discuss a paper you co-authored with lead author Sumit Verma and Xinguang Guao. Uh, speaking of workflows and specific regional play, this article addresses uh, both of those things in the special section Seismic Data Conditioning. So tell us a bit about what you all found applying 5D interpolation with these legacy seismic surveys from the 1990s. Well, since these uh, two authors were former students of mine, uh, my thoughts might be a little bit biased. But nevertheless, the 5D interpolation of land data has been one of the major technological innovations in seismic processing in the past five years, and it's provided by almost all of the, uh, the software vendors and major service providers. Now, the 5 of 5D, for, for those who aren't seismic processing, refers to the five axes of the seismic data. The first axis is the vertical axis, time. The second one is the X position, uh, let's call it east. Third one is the Y position, let's call it north. And then we have source receiver offset, measured in feet and meters, and source receiver azimuth from the north, measured in degrees. So there's five different dimensions. Now, older surveys, or let's call it suboptimum surveys, because seismic surveys are expensive. We can't get everything we'd like to with a finite amount of money. They're going to have holes in them. We're going to be missing certain offsets. We're going to be missing certain azimuths. We may even be missing certain locations because there's a road in the way or other obstacles. So the most common workflow is to apply a very careful velocity analysis, normal move out and statics. And what that does is it generates a common midpoint super gather that's as flat as possible. Now the next step after you flatten is to fit a bunch of planes through the flattened data. If it's perfectly flat, you only need one plane. Okay, it's never going to be perfectly flat. 
So you're going to have a finite number of planes, and then you're going to use those planes to interpolate the missing data. Now, um, my buddy, uh, colleague Satinder Chopra up in Canada, he and I have put together uh, or written a paper in the leading edge showing the impact of 5D interpolation on mapping faults and fractures. Now, what it does is it greatly reduces the acquisition footprint, but it somehow suppresses the sharpness of the edges. Now, when you think about that, that's because those edges are associated with diffractors. Now, the paper by uh, Verma and Guo, they hypothesize that this smearing is caused by the misinterpolation of these non-planar diffractions. So only part of the diffractions are estimated or properly estimated by the normal move-out correction. The rest of them are unmoved out, so they can't be represented by these planar events. Instead, what Verma and Guo do, they uh, use a more computationally expensive approach and use demigration operators to interpolate the data. They then apply it to this old data, 15-fold, so very low-fold, from North Texas. They find very nice results. They suppress acquisition footprint, and they maintain uh, very sharp uh, fault edges. Now, I want to mention this workflow uh, fits neatly into a technique called least squares migration. And as the uh, current editor of interpretation, I want to uh, enlist authors for an upcoming special section on exactly that topic. Well, the call is out now. One thing I also liked about that article was that you it was very clear from the author's wording when this would be useful, or as you mentioned, when it might possibly be too computationally expensive to, to use this workflow. Right. For those not familiar with seismic processing, the bottom line is if you have the money, collect the data as densely as possible. Denser data gives you better results. So all these articles in all of the May 2016 issue can be read in print, as Kurt prefers, or in the SEG digital library at library.seg.org. Subscribers can read the full articles in the digital library, and for those currently not subscribed, abstracts for each of the interpretation papers are always free. To learn more about becoming a member or subscribing to interpretation, visit aapg.org or scg.org. Kurt? I thank you for sharing some of the highlights and look forward to speaking with you on the forthcoming August issue. I appreciate this opportunity, Andrew, so thank you very much. And in the August issue, uh, Isaac Farley and I are going to push another concept for, again, younger or technology adept readers, and that's to put the abstracts in an audio form. So like this podcast that we're doing right now, it's time to embrace the newest technology and apply it to the four billion year old Earth. We look forward to hearing more about that and reading that upcoming article. Okay, thanks again. SEG.org slash podcast, you will find the show notes and past episodes of Seismic Sound Off. Subscribe to the show on iTunes or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you enjoy the show, please review us on iTunes. It makes a big difference. Thank you to Kurt Marford for joining me. Email us at podcast at seg.org or call us at country code 1-918-497-4627 with your comments and ideas for future shows. We would love to hear from you. Our next show will be with Jim Geyser, the 2016 Disc Lecturer. Season 1 of Seismic Sound Off is sponsored by the SEG Wiki home to hundreds of biographies of key geoscientists, geophysical tutorials, and core content from the science of applied geophysics. Learn more at wiki.seg.org. This show was produced by Isaac Farley and Andrew Gary. Original music by Zach Bridges. Thank you for listening. This is Seismic Sound Off, signaling off. Hello everyone, my name is Stacy, Manuscript Submission Specialist with SEG. The Society of Exploration Geophysicists, founded in 1930, is a not-for-profit organization committed to providing high-quality educational, networking, and professional development resources to 24,000 members in 126 countries. To learn how you can become a member of SEG, please visit seg.org. 
I look forward to helping you further your career as a member of SEG. Thank you for listening, and please come back often.